How are you doing, brother? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's good. It's good to be here. It's good to see you. I mean, uh, when I met you, you were still trying to get into the industry. It's so true. You used to come uh, job shadow me at Five FM. I had no idea you were fluent in Afrikaans until one day I was like, no man, I know this voice, but I don't know Afrikaans coming out of his mouth. And I was like, oh, flip, okay, that's where he is. So yeah, man, it's, it's been amazing to watch you come up, bro. I'm re really proud of you. It's truly humbling to me because I can remember bumping into you at the airport. Yes, sir. And I came to you and I actually introduced myself because I know in the industry we meet so many people, mm. but you remembered me. Absolutely. You remembered me and it really meant a lot to me. Yes, sir. Thank you, Fresh. You know what? This is actually me um, calling you in and having this beautiful interview with you because I want to give you your flowers, man. Thank you very much. I prefer cash, but I'll take flowers. <laughs> you know, flowers will do for now. I definitely want to give you your flowers and I want to honor you. Thank you so much for honoring us with your time. And as you said, I shouted you at 5FM and there's a lot that has happened in between. Yes, sir. What would you say were some of your most valuable lessons that you've learned in between? Geez, I think consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, I think the hallmark of my career, I mean, I started on radio in 1992. So this, were well, you alive in 92? <laughs> anyway, I mean, yeah, so I started my career literally the, baby, yeah. <laughs> the first weekend of July 1992. So it'll be 32 years this coming July. So, but one thing I've learned is consistency is a business plan. For sure. If consistency will get you return business, will get you return listeners. Um, I mean, even just Radio 101 tells you that if you're consistent with, uh, you know, whether it's your benchmarks or you keep your clock as is and you respect your clock, your listeners want consistency. Mm. And because of that, I think uh, that's why I remain memorable for a lot of people. DJ Fresh, how have you remained consistent? Because we are in a very, um, can I say, fast-paced microwave generation at the moment. Sure. sure. We are really going at it. But DJ Fresh has remained DJ Fresh. Sure. How have you done that? Um, I think you, the, the, the answer is in your very question that you just asked. I've never tried to be anyone else. You know what I mean? I've, I've, I've been, uh, you know, and, and people love authenticity. I've never tried to be someone else. I've never tried to sound like someone else. I've always been authentically me. Um, if you think I am a caring guy on the radio, that's because I'm a caring For guy. Sure. It's not an act. Mm. You know what I mean? And and I think a lot of people treat radio like some stage or there's a switch. I must now switch on. And now I must put on my radio voice because yeah. I'm this big guy with the voice of God. I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm uh, you know, how I speak to you at the airport is how I speak to you on the radio. I'm not going to put on a voice about it. I'm not going to put on an attitude. I'm not going to all of a sudden think I'm the man if I don't think I'm the man. 100%. So, so, so for me, authenticity, again, is another business plan. Oof. If you have authenticity in your business plan, in whatever you do, because people can see through inauthenticity. Mm. People can see through this is just an act. I've never been an act. I've just been a guy who loves radio, who loves music, who loves... Uh, you know, changing people's lives. And again, like I said to you, because of that, I've endeared myself to so many people. And whether I'm on radio or not, I'll continue getting the same amount of love. Come on. Yes, sir. Come on, come on. Allow me to take you back to that uh, ground roots, basically, of um, where you come from, your parents. And I'm going to start it off by saying this. Emily Sogum and Sugarcane yes, is sir. what your grandmoms basically used to, to, to get your dad into school and through school. And that's yes, how sir. she sacrificed, right? So my dad was the only child of wife number five because my granddad was a polygamist. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so my grandma was wife number five and my granddad passed away while my dad was uh, still a toddler. So because of politics of polygamy, I suppose, uh, my grandma wasn't necessarily treated w well by the other wives. Mm -hmm. And because of that, she realized that she had to work a little extra harder uh, so that her son can get somewhere. And as a result of that, you know, my dad, I mean, he excelled in school. Indeed. Um, and just from subsistence farming, she, you know, she got him through school. And that's the sacrifice that she made. And I want to ask you, what are some of the sacrifices that you make for your kids? I think the sacrifices I've made for my kids are, you know, often burning the candle at both ends. Sure. And, and, and I guess it's a blessing and a curse because I love what I do so much. I don't know when not to, st or not to do it. 
You know what I mean? So there are days where I know I need to stop. But the passion burns Oof. more than oh, the fatigue. Me, than the fatigue burns. So often I'll follow that as ill-advised as it might be. So I think those are some of the sacrifices you make for your kids. But, the- but unfortunately in our industry, and I don't know if I'm the one who suffers from parental guilt. Because I'm always Ooh, on the road. 100%. <laughs> because I'm always on the road, I, I feel bad all the time. I mean, I was in Spain this past weekend, and I made sure that as soon as I was done, I came back home because I miss my kids. You know what I mean? I mean, any other person would have taken an extra week off. That is my next question, actually, as to how you get over that, because um, 100% what you're saying, you know, yeah. I, I get to MC and I get to DJ as well on stages, sure. and you're away most of the time. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, the question that I want to ask you is, is it really worth it? Is it worth it being away from your family and for, from your kids for such a long time? You know what I've learned? What I've learned is kids appreciate whatever time you can make for them, mm. being quality time with them. I'll, I'll explain to you. Yes. Um, because often we think because we can't spend enough time with our kids, if I buy them stuff, if I'm the so-called dollar dad... I'm compensating for that. And that's so irresponsible as a parent. But what I've learned is all kids want is time. Even if it's on Saturday, we're going to spend an hour and go to the arcade. Mm. Show up for that appointment. Often as parents, we don't even diarize those appointments. We diarize everything else in our lives. But we don't diarize time with my boy, time with my daughter. And what I'm learning is because the individuals... Because another mistake I find we make as parents is we have a one-size-fits-all approach to parenting. Mm. We forget that we're dealing with... Different individuals. It's different individuals Mm -hmm. wired differently with different needs. Mm. You know what I mean? But we think because your sister's good at maths, why are you not good at maths? Mm. Maybe I'm not wired for maths. So you need to parent me accordingly. You know what I mean? Likewise with education. If we educated our kids according to their strengths we'd probably get stronger adults out there because we catered for a child according to the child's needs. So I'm finding that if you parent in a similar manner, that's why, for instance, what I do once a week, each kid gets an hour lunch. We go for lunch, just the two of us. So they have that time. They're not competing for my time. Dude, that one hour a week will get you is more currency than anything you could do for that child that week. They just want time. And often the time we think we're spending with them is dinner with the other kids. Dinner with mom and the other kids. It's never just the one-on-one. So so that's how I compensate for always being on the road. I made sure that the time we do spend is quality time. I don't even touch my phone. You have my 100% attention. So, So, yeah. You wished that your dad believed in you from get-go yeah. uh, when you wanted to be a DJ and not really move you into the law side of things. You sure. Know? Um, would you say that uh, talking about how you parent your kids at the moment, do you allow them that, that uh, my son, my daughter, if you want to be this, I'm going to support you 100%? They can be whatever the hell they want to be. As they long don't as have to follow in dad's footsteps. They don't have to. I mean, if they choose to follow in my footsteps, I will not discourage them. I mean, I'll just because... The things I've learned along the way, mm. I might share those with them, but I'm not, I know better than to suppress the dreams of anyone. You know what I mean? So, as much as my parents not supporting what they thought was just a hobby, because I started doing this when I was in grade eight. I mean, I was 13 when I started doing yeah, this. Yeah. And this is this is all I've done my entire life. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know if that's my phone. If it is, I apologize. Fresh or busy, my feet. Fresh or busy. This is all I've done my entire life, mm. bro. And, and because I had to chart my own way, because also at the time, there was not even a black DJ I could say to my parents, but so-and-so this is what I'm looking up to. So yes. so has made it work. Yes. It was me literally referencing DJs in the US, and my parents couldn't be, like, they couldn't care less that a little Louis Vega or a Tony Humphreys are influencing me. You know what I mean? Uh. But I often ask myself, have I come this far because I had to work doubly as hard because I didn't have parental support or would have parental support Excuse made me, me complacent mm. and lazy and maybe not have me push as hard? I'll never know, obviously, but that's the debate I have with myself all the time. Oof. You know? Bad, oh bad. Allow me to stick to that because um, you are a collector of cassettes or you were a collector of cassettes. Yes, Let me sir. say that. Yeah. What else do you collect? 
Because I know, oh, you smell good. You always, that's one thing that I can remember about Fresh, guys. Yes, sir. You always smell good. <laughs> um, you know what it is? Because my dad always smelled good. Um, I I picked that up from him. So I've always loved fragrances. Whenever my dad's fragrances were almost uh, uh, clapped, mm -hmm. I'd take that bottle and, and turn it into mine. But he always said that, you know, when you want designer fragrances, you must work for those designer work fragrances. Hard for them, yeah. But until then, I'm going to just get you... What was it at the time? Before it was Axe. Mm, brute. It was New Ice, I think. <laughs> Not New Ice, man. It was, it was something else before. But anyway, so it was, you know, if you want to smell nice, you'll get you the, the basic fragrances. But I've always loved fragrances, dude. I've always loved fragrances. So I collect those. I mean, I've got probably between three and 400 bottles. Wow. Um, and of course, you travel a lot. So all of the other countries, you get them as well. Not always, though. Mm. Because my dude has fragrances you won't find at any airport. You, know, you must always have a dude. All right, cool. Yeah, after you, this, uh, after you know, this you, interview, go on connect. <laughs> we will talk. You must always have a guy that is so passionate about mm. it that he will bring stuff in that not many of you are going to have. Mm. Because if you're going to Red Square, you know, with all due respect, you're going to smell like a hundred other guys. True. But if you have a dude, I mean, I'm, I'm even at a stage where I found a perfumer and she mixes scents for me. Nah. So that yes, are signature scents. Yes. You know what I mean? So, for instance, my podcast is literally working on a scent right now. That is amazing. I mean, scent is a big deal. Dude. It is. I mean, it right is. now, you go to any major hotel sure. across the globe, they have a signature scent. Mm. Because our senses are probably, like, of all the senses, your sense of smell will always take you somewhere. Even like now, I mean, if you smell something like depending on how you were raised, if you smell something like Vim powder, mm. it might take you back to your childhood. Yeah, definitely. Because maybe you were forced to uh, to scour the pots after after having dinner. Yeah. So for me, scent is a big deal. And, and, and I always preach, people never forget how you make them feel. Oof. And when you smell good, people don't forget you. So, so yeah, for me, I collect fragrances. I kind of used to collect watches, but I, I was like, no, it's, it's fine. I... I just want a practical watch that can tell me how many steps I have so Discovery can smile every month. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm so I'm back to that. But I also collect t-shirts. I've got probably, geez, bro, um, easily 500 t-shirts. Whoa. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a t-shirt collector of note. So, My goodness. So, so, yeah. And children, I've got five. <laughs> With the youngest at the moment being eight, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Lefika just yes. turned nine. He's in grade three. And, uh, yeah. Man, oh, man. And like you said, they're all different. They're all different, which is amazing. I'm going to take you back to um, your childhood uh, at the age of 15. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to start it off by saying this. Being a reclusive person, right? Um, your mom left for the U.S. Yeah. And your friend relocated to Norway. Sure. Oscar. And uh, yes, 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 indeed. And your girlfriend, unfortunately, cheated on you at that time. The same day Oscar left that night, I caught her with one of the senior boys in a classroom, bro. Oh. Exactly. Rich, how do you deal with that? You're 15. What are you going to do, bro? Do you, Go to the boarding house and cry. Oh, God. Nah, you know what? I didn't even cry about it. I just took it as, okay, that's what it is. You know what? One thing that I know that in, in, in that age you are more likely to also fall into a bit of depression and even think of think of suicide yeah how did you get through that because that is a you just turned into a boy you're discovering yourself you're discovering sure. that there's things in your body yeah mm. and that a bottle of dawn is not just for <laughs> it's not just for <laughs> for moisturizing purposes I, I hear you dog that's when i was like oh that's why they call it dawn <laughs> Yeah, they call it all for a reason, dog. It's a companion. Oh man, take us through. Take so, us through that. No, no. I, I mean, I, I did go through a, 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 a suicidal patch uh, when I was what 15 at the time, uh, because as much as I was in a boarding house full of boys, mm. and also easily some of the coolest boys and kids I've, I'll ever encounter in my in, in my life. I mean, a boarding house was was incredible. I mean, it was like talented kids, athletes like musicians like it was it was it was an amazing boarding house but have you ever been in a group of people but you still feel alone yeah oh, so, so, so that's 100%. what it was that's what it was and also because my best friend had relocated my mom had moved to the u.s to study for three years um yeah i literally felt alone 
And I remember there was a time I sat behind the library and I had a handful of pills. Uh, there were alert tablets for staying awake so you can study. Mm. So I had a handful of those. I was literally ready to take those. But um, I don't know, just something said, listen, in fact, what actually stuck in my mind, because I'd read an article about Ray Piri, a frontman of uh, Stimela, mm. the, the band. And he, uh, in that article, spoke about how, you know, he's part of the, one of the most successful bands in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's working with Paul Simon at the time. They're working on Graceland. Ooh, so he man, did some of the yes. guitar work on, on Graceland. And he was talking about how he's, he's a recluse. He's still lonely. He's alone often because he just feels alone, despite all the success, all these cool band members around mm -hmm. him. And, you know, that article stuck with me that sometimes it's okay to be alone. Mm. First, but how do you deal, and this is something that I, I've actually opened up to my listener about, yeah. that I, after a gig, mm. there is that time of you driving home, you're alone in the car, and that post-gig depression like hits you, man. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I, all, the, the thing is, I get a lot of that because I am, I'm looking for the right words. Mm. I, I, and this is not at, at a romantic level. I fall in love very easily. So whether it's at a gig, so if it's at a gig, just that emotion Come I'm on, feeling. I've seen you. Oh, you engaged. Yes. You, you know what I mean? So it's such a high mm. that the only other way I could hit that high is probably take drugs. But I will never take drugs mm. because I understand what drugs will do to you. You know what I mean? So because I've been doing this for as long as I've been doing it, I deal with that post-gig depression literally every weekend or every month or every year. But the reason it's never for long is because I know there's another one coming up. Oh! You know what I mean? <laughs> so it gives me a reason to look forward to the next one. It gives me a reason to look at how am I going to do things differently. So for instance, I mean, I remember there was a time, I can't remember who was shadowing me at all of my gigs. Uh -huh. Um, he works in the, in, in, the, in the recording industry and I think I had four gigs that night and I played four totally different sets and he was like like I thought wow. I'd hear the, I was like I'd be bored if I played the four same sets every night you know what I mean so that's how I keep myself interested in how, what I do that I must change it up all the time oh man 100% and, and also if by chance you have even just one fan that follows you to every gig they must never ever know what you're gonna play next. That was me. I can remember the one night I was still in tertiary. I yeah. met you. There was a news cafe in Sunnyside that you were playing. Sure. And then afterwards, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you went and played in Hatfield, and straight afterwards, I think in Mainland, and I followed you to all of these gigs. Yeah. And I must say, that is one thing that I've learned from you as well is that you play different sets mm -hmm. in each and every place that you were at. I try and do that. Obviously, you'll have your favorite songs. Mm. You know, there's favorite songs that you might repeat because you love them and the crowd love loves them. Loves them as well, but yes. But generally, I try and mix it up. I try to surprise myself. And, you know, people often ask, do you prepare your sets? I was like, I don't even know the first song I'm going to play when I walk into a place. Wow. I, I, I have a saying read the crowd yes. rock the crowd for sure that's what i do that's why one of the reasons i'm an advocate for arrive an hour early if you can so that you can listen to the guy before you be a part of that energy and then add to that energy a lot of guys treat this like just another statistic just another gig for me it's energy is everything bro come on and you're part of a night that has been curated so give a damn about what else is happening around your set. So for instance, before a gig, I ask for the entire lineup. Don't send me the time I'm playing. Send me everyone that's playing before me and after me. Because then I know generally who's going to play in what direction. And I know how I can add value to that curated night. Fresh, how important is that? Because I always tell people, you know, I you have to know your role as well. Yeah. You have to know your role. I, ca I cannot come in at 8 yeah. and play all the bangers sure. and expect who's going to play that at 12 or whatever sure. the case may be. And that's yeah. how you also have to humble yourself, yeah. right? To basically get to that place where you get that prime time slot. That's another thing I preach all the time, that know your role within the, the bigger scheme of the night. You know what I mean? Unless it's a massive music festival, maybe it's a different story. But if you're playing at a club or a lounge, like I said, know the role you're going to play. Mm. And also ask yourself, how am I going to stand out from every DJ here? 
Hence, it helps to know who plays before you, who plays after you, and know a bit about them. If you give a damn about the culture, you'll make a bit of an effort and do a bit of research. But most guys don't care. They just want the check. They just want to play, you know, you know, uh, what is it? Sex, drugs, and house music. Oh, you know? man. No, for, no, for a lot I, of guys, that's all it has I become. Hear you. Which is unfortunate. But that's why I've been doing this for 30 years and they haven't. Come on. You know, so, so yeah. I want to take you back while you're on your 30 years. At YFM, um, you were managed by Lebo Gunguluza and yes, then sir. managed by uh, Seaport Lamini. Yes, sir. Who basically literally unlocked yeah. who Fresh is. And you got you also got to know what your worth is and what your pricing is. How important is that? Because I, I get that I DJ and I MC and when I put my rate down, people are like, ah, yeah. we're expensive. Sure. How did you get to know your value? The thing is, because it's subjective, often it's trial and error until you find that sweet spot. I always say what you are worth is probably somewhere right in between what you are quoting and what they've budgeted for you. But often they will try and push the envelope a bit more than you or, or take a chance that if I can get in for 10 rand, let me mm-hmm. do that. But often right in the middle of your quote and that offer is probably where you should peg yourself. And then you can just increase it incrementally every year depending on how you know how much you think your star is rising. So, so, so yeah. How do you say no? That's it. You've said it, bro. Man, you and said that's it. that's just and, like because you you know you know the, the 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 reason why I ask that is how do you say no is that um, an excuse how I'm saying this is going to come actually across as very insecure but how does that affect you then getting more bookings? I think you reach a stage in your career where you know exactly the value you bring to every event, and you stick to your guns. Obviously, you know, you can compromise on your rate depending on the relationship you have because mm. this industry is also about relationships. So, I mean, I, I have a policy at my office that if you've booked me five times, the sixth gig is, is on the house. Just as part of me saying thanks for the support. That is amazing. And that's how you build relationships. That's how you have sustainable relationships in the industry. Don't just take, 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 take. You know what I mean? Offer Love something it. back. So I, I, I will do a free gig where I know I'm booked often or I will play an extra hour every time they hire me uh, because I enjoy playing there. So um, there so the are various ways that you can create relationships that are sustainable and will ensure that you have repeat bookings. You I've, know? I've, I've been reading a book uh, by Alex Ormosi, $100 million deals. Sure. And that is indeed what I see that you're doing is you're seeing how you can add value more than, as you say, you know, take, take, take. Yeah. And it, it is that type of industry where you have to know when to give sure. and when to take. Absolutely. Fresh, you are a giver of notes. Mm. And I'm going to basically go to this story. Um, it was your birthday. And um, there's two boys that came through to the studio to actually wish you happy birthday. Um, they had a cake. One of them being um, Spewe, dressed properly. Yeah. And you stepped a bit outside to meet them, of course. And then you went back inside and you, you had a moment. You yeah. had a moment and you wept. Yeah. It was a teardrop. <laughs> I wasn't like weeping like an African widow wanting to throw herself into the hole with the casket. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's okay to cry. It's okay to cry. <laughs> but I, I know wept wept sounds more dramatic and more descriptive, but I shed a tear. How important is it for you to give back? Because that's what you do. Um, and that's why I say I, I've I've literally asked for this to also give you your flowers. In sure. <sighs> I'll get to what you have done for me. Sure. But clearly you've done so much for these boys to actually honor you, to mm. take time from their busy day to yep. come and bring you a cake on your birthday. Mm. And that meant a lot to you, right? And there's yep. so much more that you do. Yeah, let me let me tell you why that moment meant a lot to me before I answer the, the, the bigger question. Mm-hmm. So Spiwe is one of the first kids, one of the first three kids that I gave a bursary to 25 years ago. So about 25 years ago, I set up my foundation uh, because every day I'd get to YFM and there's a kid, I want to go to varsity, but I can't afford it. Mm. Um, so what I did at the time, I, I because I was obviously, I'd studied at Boston Media House. So I approached Boston Media House and asked them for three bursaries. 
that I'd like to give her three bursaries. Uh, there's kids out there, there's need and everything else. I approached YFM, they gave me the airtime, I put out the adverts. So Spear is one of the first kids, one of the first three kids I gave a bursary to. So his way of, because every time I give kids bursaries, I've done about 2,000 now. Every time I give kids bursaries, they ask me how, you know, how do I pay you back? Or what is the catch? And I always tell all of them the day you can put another kid through school. Come on. Do the same. That's all I need from you. So just seeing how Spire has been successful, he's like super corporate. So, you know, every milestone he'd share with me. I just bought a car. I just bought a house. You know what I mean? My firstborn is on the way. Um, I mean, there's, for instance, uh, Gigi Matseke. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a big deal in the uh, world of marketing and advertising. I mean, I remember when he won his bursary, his mom worked at Pick and Pay in Norwood. Yes, yes, yes. And, <laughs> and the number that he put on his letter, application letter... Was his mom's number was, at work. Yeah. So I call and the manager answered, and, and this is live on, on radio, on YFM. So I asked him to call, um, I'm, I'd like to speak to um, Ms. Matseke because her son has won a bursary. And so I told her live on the radio and she was yelling and screaming in the middle of the Pick and Pay. <laughs> Louder than when they say declines, when your car declines. You know what I mean? So, and, and so, so moments like that, then seeing how these kids have become men and women that just are flying. For me, that's like, it's, 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 it's incredible. Or looking at, you know, kids that I mentored, you know, whether it's a DJ Cleo, DJ's Boo. Come on. Um, 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 Euphonic, um, uh, Dino Bravo, uh, yourself. You know what I mean? So when I look at people that I've mentored or people that I've had a role in their careers in terms of either pointing them in the right direction or giving them advice, to see them fly for me is it's incredible. But why I do it? Um, I discovered my purpose when I was in high school. Um, I remember reading The Alchemist. I went into the school library. There was a brand new book, The Alchemist. I read that book. Uh -huh. And it's at that stage that I knew my purpose was to make a difference in people's lives. So my being on radio is how I minister. It was just a platform. That's mm. why I do it, whether I'm on radio, whether I'm on TV, whether I'm on social media. If I have an opportunity to change someone's life, I'll do it. Because mm. it's part of my bigger journey. Man. So it's not, and it's not a PR thing. That's why you'll never see me on the front page of, of a newspaper saying these are the kids of Central School. I don't PR it at all because it's not for PR. I so, love yeah. that. I love that, Fresh. And it brings me to my next point. I want to I wanna thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I can remember I called into your show. Is this the briefcase of money about to come out? <laughs> here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> I'm looking at the hidden cameras, but I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing a briefcase of money. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you. I want to thank you for, for allowing me because I know that I called you on air and I actually asked you, can I come through? Mm -hmm. And you said, yeah. Mm -hmm. You said, yeah, come through. And I got to spend about two months with you. Yeah. And in... in, in, in you're, um, my, you're my son now. Yes. <laughs> in African culture, two months. You know, just like... What is it? Is it staying with someone for two <laughs> years? Is, is, is common law marriage or something? You're my son now. Indeed. Indeed. I'm glad to be. I'm glad to be. And um, I came through and I spent two months with you. And it was incredible. I got to sit. You actually allowed me to sit behind you. You, got, you allowed me to be in the produce. You allowed me to basically do anything. And that sparked this dream in sure, me sure. and i was like man i need to do i need to do something about this you know yes, and uh 13 years later i'm here at jacaran fm and it's been a dream come true but not only that it goes deeper than that because mm -hmm. you inspired me so much that i can now put food on the table yes, for my sir. family yes, sir. you've inspired me so much that i went over into djing and i could find another love that i have yes sir. and that is priceless yeah that is priceless yeah. so thank you so so much for what you do uh, for the industry for me <laughs> and that you're still keeping on that you're still keeping on because i saw you this weekend on saturday mm. djing alongside black coffee yes, and sir. You were so into it. I was like, look at Fresh. He is so into it. How many years still, or how many years later yeah. from when he started? Mm. He's still into it. He's still doing it. Is there a time that you're going to say, I'm done? Uh, first things first, uh, pleasure is all mine, my dude. Like I said, it's, it's part of my journey. My Part of my journey is how many lives can I affect or change? Man. You know what I mean? I mean, I did the same for Lula. I don't know, you know Lula yes, from, from YFM? Yes, yes, uh, Lula was in high school. She came to 5FM with her mom. They, were, they stood by the window waving. 
And she came in and said, listen, I'd like to shadow you because I'm thinking of going into radio. And her mom forced her to do it because she was scared to come into the studio. And Lula came and spent a couple of weeks with us. And I just mentored her, you know, and I just told her, this is what you need to do to get to where you need to get to. It, it, it really shocked me because you know what? You're not like, ah, oh, you're in my space. You're like, no, come through. Let me teach you. Let me tell you why I operate like that. I don't operate from a mindset of scarcity. So I don't fear you're going to take my job. There's only one me. So you're not going to replace me. <laughs> yes, you might be the next person in my shoes, but you're not going to replace me. You know what I mean? So because I understand the value I bring to every table that I'm at, I never fear someone else taking what I have. Because what I offer is different to what you're going to offer. And I can take what I offer somewhere else and I will get appreciation there. That is why it doesn't scare me to mentor people. That's why it doesn't scare me to play alongside uh, people who might be even more talented than I am. And oh. in fact, if you're more talented than I am, even better. Good. Yes. Because then I can learn from you. Come on. And for me, that's what mentorship in the bigger scheme of things should be. If I can't learn from you, why should I mentor you? Because then there's no relationship. You know what I mean? That is why I mentor young kids because I know they come with a different mindset. Mm. They come with a different approach. Uh, and maybe the levels of naivete is what I need to see because as you start doing something for as long as I've been doing this, you start only going the tried and tested route where someone who's never done it before is naive and is willing to go a route that might have lions and tigers and dragons. And sometimes you need lions, tigers and dragons to remind you of your mm. mortality mm. and to remind you why you do what you do and why you should do it at the level that you do it at. So that is why I mentor people. It's actually more for me than it's for them. Which is so amazing. You know what I mean? So anyway, to answer your question about Spain, the weirdest thing about my DJ career is the past five years, I've probably enjoyed more than I've enjoyed the past 30 years combined. I'm just loving wow. it more now than I've ever loved it. It's, 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 it's the weirdest thing. You know, people half my age at 8 p.m. want to go to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, no, dude, I'm, I'm loving this. Like, it's, it's incredible. Oh, you're giving me hope. So I'm, I'm 35, so it means that... Oh, you're I a still, child. You're yeah, a child. I still, I still have a nice, nice long way to go. I want to get to the business side of DJ Fresh because you're an amazing businessman as well. I hope um, so. <laughs> look, Oship, uh, you've started um, uh, Wow, What a Week. And I think there's, there's so many. You DJ, you do, you do so much. Yes, sir. Right? How do you run the business side of your things basically removed from can i say radio yeah mm. you know what i learned was that radio should be a gateway to the rest of your career radio shouldn't be your mainstay and i remember i did a radio course when i start when i was starting at boston uh, solid gold fm um, had a radio course and the first thing um, tony sanderson said to us was your radio salary every month should be minimum a quarter of what you make a month. You must leverage the fact that you're on radio to do other things. 100%. And so that's what I've learned to do, but also I've learned to do it in such a way that people should want to buy into who you are and what you stand for, and not for because you're on radio. Because the minute the radio stops, then everything else stops. And you don't want that. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I've been off radio for, what, three years now? But I'm gigging more. Flip, I even won two radio awards where I was off the radio. <laughs> you, you know what it I mean? It just shows how good you are. And, Is and there any chance that you're going to go back to radio? Uh, next first? year, next year. Whoa. Uh, yeah, so next year. Whoa. Th that's Whoa. All, that's all, that's and all, that's, that's all you can that's say, That's right? all I'm telling you. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm coming here to be your co-host. We'll hey. see. No, no, but, but, but definitely next year. The thing is, the past two years, I've been busy with a project in Botswana. Okay. And I'm wrapping up that project end of this year, beginning of next year. So then I'll be able to focus on my first love. No, what my a second blessing. love. What a yeah. blessing. Um, but in terms of, like I said, running businesses, dude, I mean, I, I'm from a school of life is too short to do anything you don't enjoy. So even if I go into business, it has to be something I enjoy. It has to be something that will feed my soul. Mm. Uh, it has to be something that will meet my bigger purpose, if that's what it needs to be. But I'll never do anything I don't enjoy. So even like Oh Ship, uh, when we came up with the concept, I remember there'd been a Miller Rock the Boat for I think a year or two, mm. and then they shelved that project. And myself, Euphonic, and the guys at Revelate 
who done Miller rock the boat, uh, we, we decided that let's let's do a cruise. Oh, and as with any business, the first three years were rough. Yeah, it took time to basically um, gain profit. And we took a bath, bra. The first three years, um, I remember the first one we kind of broke even. Or did we lose? I think we lost the second one, just broke even. Third one, we maybe made like a thousand rand profit. But because my parents were business people, I understand that business is exactly that. It's blood, sweat, and your firstborn son. You know what I mean? And and there's not and and it you know it's it's sad to see people glamorizing entrepreneurship. Mm. Entrepreneurship is not it's sexy. It's hard. Oh, it's, it's hard. It's, it's not sexy. Man. It's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of sleepless nights. It's sometimes not taking a salary because you must pay your people first. Mm -hmm. So the first three years of O-Ship were really rough. I think we made our first proper profit in year five. And now we're at year, what, 13, 14? And now you get uh, people that get off the boat and already book for the next one. No, no, like we sold out O-Ship 2024 in less than a month. Wow. And I remember MSC saying to us, do we want to do another one the following weekend? But we felt it would be bad for business to do that because then next year people are gonna relax mm. so our goal is next year to sell out 2025 in a week or less Man. but because people trust the brand they trust what it stands for uh, that business sells out before we even announce the lineup i mean only announcing the lineup in a week or two but already sold out because people trust it i mean we have a waiting list of i think three thousand people now so we could literally fill another ship and a half Man. And 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 <laughs> and I think it's a dream to be able to build a brand like that, especially um, in entertainment. And so as you said, it took time. It took time. It mm. took sacrifice. It took time. It took patience, and it took understanding that when the fire starts, the fire will start. And I think you need to remember that when you uh, you know undertake any project. Come on. That if it's worth your time, effort, your blood, your sweat, and your firstborn son, that when the fire catches, it will. Fritz, this is another project that you took on. Definitely you know this song. Yeah, cool and deadly. Yeah, this is the song that made me fall in love with you even more. <laughs> 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 Collaborations, how important is that for you especially in the business um you told us so, so beautifully just now that you know mm -hmm. what uh you're not in a place of being or feeling threatened sure. in the business um but how important is collaborations like with euphonic um the song that you guys did it's amazing it, it goes back to what i was saying that you can only grow and learn from collaborations sure and again i'm not going to collaborate with anyone i'm mm. not going to learn from you know, I'm not going to collaborate with anyone that is not going to bring some sort of value. Even if you're a rookie, the value you're going to bring will be apparent already from either your work rate or how driven you are or the legwork you've done already. A lot of people come to you and say, I need a mentor. But what they actually mean is, please hold my hand and take me to the water. Show me it's the water and then get me a cup and then make me drink the water. I don't work with people mm. like that. I work with people that... So I can never say I made someone. Because I work with people that are going to make it at some stage. Come on. I might have just been a catalyst. You know what I mean? And as that catalyst, as I'm mentoring them, I'm learning from them. So that was why it was easy for me to work with a Euphonic or to, you know, have Kent on my radio shows for, for 20 years. That is another golden thing that you did. The Ultimate Tech 6. Yeah. I, I, I cannot start to match. You know, there's still people now. Um, I, I, I go through my Facebook and they're like, and guys, do you remember those days? The Ultimate Tech 6. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's something that you basically, and that was also a platform because I know I sent in one of my mixes to sure. you and you played it on air. Yeah. I mean, that is absolutely incredible what you've done for music as well. Mm -hmm. Where did that start? I think it started way back in, uh, in at Wild. Right. So at YFM, I did the afternoon drive show yes. and I had a feature called the Mad Half Hour. Yes. So I literally started my drive show with a live DJ mix that I did. So the first week on air on Y, I was doing that mix. Mm -hmm. uh, literally 3 p.m. straight out of news, play the sting into the mix. That's how people started the, you know, the afternoons on my, on, my, on my drive show. And it actually influenced pretty much every other drive show in the whole country. Because before you knew it, every drive show had a mix. That's very true. And this true. is back in 1997. I mean, my two shows now on Jacaranda FM, they both have mixes. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so 
Then there was a time I'm coming into work, I think three weeks into YFM being a, a radio station, I find Iggy Smalls. Yes. Waiting. Well, I find this kid with dreadlocks, like with neatly manicured uh, dreadlocks, neatly twisted, waiting at reception. And he introduced himself. Hi, my name is Iggy Smalls. Um, I play at Tebes Club in Yeovil. I'd like to be a guest uh, on your show. So I told him, okay, come in tomorrow. And Iggy Smalls was the first ever guest we had on the uh, Mad Half Hour. And then because people heard him play, then it started a whole avalanche of everyone else wanted to come and play. So that's how we, 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 we discovered the likes of your Cleos, your... Okay, Mbuso was a household name already, mm -hmm. but I mean, he was a regular on there. Mm -hmm. uh, your DJs, Booze, they all came through the Mad Half Hour. DJ Jaws, they all came through the Mad Half Hour. So the Mad Half Hour became such a household name that by the end of January of each year, my diary for the year was full with DJs who were going to play on the Mad Half Hour. And then at the time, because tobacco was still allowed in terms and of the advertising, mm -hmm. uh, then the, the guys with the animal or the hump, because um, I don't know if we're allowed to mention tobacco on radio <laughs> anymore, but the guys with the yes, animal or the we hump get, we get it, yeah. uh, decided that, listen, we want to be a part of this. We're going to sponsor it and give away an opportunity to come up with a CD release uh, for, the, for the winning DJ. And like I said, it, it, just, it, it became an animal that I believe changed the culture, that I believe created household names, uh, that I believe created a DJ economy that didn't exist before that radio feature existed. So when I moved to breakfast uh, at Y, mm. uh, then I decided that, okay, I'm going to still start the show with the mix, but I need residents. And that's how Kent came in, uh, Euphonic, Dino Bravo. So when 5FM poached me from YFM, in 2000 and we started our talks 2004 5 so i moved to 5 fm 2006 and my non-negotiable was um dino bravo is coming with me kent, kent is coming with yes. me euphonic is coming with me and we're going to have a mix at six and i believe again that was another game changer in terms of what the the industry became mm, definitely. um i think it 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 just i don't know there was there, there was definitely a seismic shift mm. uh, because of that radio feature so yeah. so yeah DJ Fresh, there's, there's still so much that I want to ask, uh, but yeah, time is not with us at the moment. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much um, uh, for gracing us with your time and no stress, uh, for honoring us with your time. And um, please come visit again. I'd, I'd love for you to come visit again. I might see you in April next year. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just polish up my Afrikaans first. <laughs> Can you speak Afrikaans? I, I, I can't. I can't have Johan Bluff for every <laughs> every link. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my Afrikaans is basic enough not to get lynched if I was ever to get lynched yes. in a small town somewhere. Mm, but right. yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, as DJ Fresh would also famously say, DJ Fresh about to leave the Jacaranda FM building. Thank you, sir. My dude, thank you very much. Proud of you. Uh, keep flying and uh, we'll see you right up at the top. Let's do this. Yes, sir. <laughs>